Dear Father, I thank You and praise You, Father, for a room full of people ready to learn Your Word. Father, You've given it to men so that we might know You and know Your Son and receive Him into our lives. And we in this room have done that, Father, as we've confessed Your name and believed in our hearts. Father, I do pray that now the real work begins, if it hasn't already, the work, Father, of turning us more Christ-like to not simply uh, witness to Him, but witness by our life. Father, the Word is given to us so that we might have the opportunity to hear our own faults in our heart as the Holy Spirit convicts and to, to know the better ways, Father, that You would teach and through Your Son's example see how they are to be lived out. I pray, Father, that the teaching I do tonight would reflect that purpose that we would not be puffed up by what we learn, but, Father, we would be grown up by how it changes us. And uh, like all the Scripture, Father, I hope that it would give us an opportunity to be better equipped for the ministry that you have set before us in whatever way we are to serve. Uh, That is our heart, Father. That's why we come tonight. I pray that uh, that is our hearts and desire. And, Father, I pray that the teaching would be worthy of that purpose, that your Holy Spirit would be active in our hearts, in mine, and in those who hear this message, that they would respond according to your Spirit, and that I would teach in your words and not mine. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Chapter 17 of Luke. As always, if you have your Bible, let's open there. Let's remind ourselves a little bit of where we were as we studied this last week. Uh, I won't give you a lot of background. It was hopefully fresh in your mind, but last week we ended 16 and then began... 17, and if you remember Jesus, as I characterized it, was rebuking his disciples. Maybe not the way most people characterize those verses. I think that's the honest way to see it, though. I think Jesus, having just taught them to be watchful for false teaching at the beginning of 17, more specifically, they were to be willing to rebuke a brother who uh, was sinning, either in sin through poor teaching or just sin generally in their life. But one way or the other, there was a person within the body who was not following the correct ways, whether in teaching or in behavior, and they had to be willing to step up as a leader in the church and correct that behavior, or correct that poor teaching. Rebuke them, in other words. We studied last week, the word rebuke actually means censure. Cease and desist, basically. And if that person repented, they were to be forgiven. If they sin over and over and over again and repent each time, they are to be forgiven, and that forgiveness must be limitless. It must continue and continue. To that command, what did the disciples do in response? They said, I think somewhat flippantly, it's not necessarily communicated that way with the words of the text, but I think in the circumstances you could see them being somewhat dismissive, and they said to him, increase our faith, which I believe means if you hope for us to obey that, if there's any hope that we're going to do what you just asked, forgive people limitlessly, in other words. The only way I can bring, up, bring myself to do that is if you increase my faith, because I'm not sure I'm up to that kind of obedience. And Jesus corrected them, and really rebuked them by teaching them, first and foremost, the problem wasn't the amount of faith they had. That's a false issue. The problem isn't the amount of faith you have, it's your willingness to do what you're told. The the amount of faith doesn't enter into obedience. In other words, faith is a prerequisite to living a life of obedience, yes, but obedience is an expectation of God. It does not depend on a degree of faith. He does not give license for poor obedience to those who are of early faith, and greater obedience for those who are of more mature faith. There's no biblical standard or biblical scale like that ever evident in Scripture. It is obedience and obedience without condition for anybody who is a follower of Christ. And we went into that in greater detail, of course, last week. But that was the basic point at where we left off. In the verses we're going to study today, Luke is going to offer a simple illustration of Jesus' point by capturing a story that probably happened within a reasonably short period of time following the events as we've studied them. I don't know if it was literally in the same moment. But as Luke introduces it here in chapter 17, verse 11, it's clear that he wants to place the story here to make a point of what had just been taught. Look in 17:11. While he was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. And he entered a village, as he entered a village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. And they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. 
and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. And we'll stop there for a moment. I want to remind you, back in chapter 9, uh, if you were with me when I went through that chapter, we were told by Luke that Jesus had set his mind on Jerusalem, and more specifically on his ascension in Jerusalem. So what you're seeing here at the beginning of, uh, of today's teaching in verse 11 is simply a continuation of that trip. We're, we're really in the midst of a trip that began back in chapter 9 and has continued on through all the chapters that have come between 9 and now. And he's just now reaching the point between Samaria and the Galilee. So that gives you an idea of how much detail Luke has added to the short trip that is represented by the time it took him to go from where he was in the Galilee to this bridging point. Uh, we studied back at that point in chapter 9 about the Samaritans and about the area called Samaria. It's the region in the nation of Israel that is sandwiched between the Galilee, which is in the northern reaches of the country, and Jerusalem, which sits sort of just south of center, just in the middle of the country, but a little south of, of the dead center of the land. And if you're in the Galilee and you're headed to Jerusalem, you've got to walk through the Samaria. You've got to walk through Samaria because it's between you and where you're going. But Samaritans were a hated people. And we'll look at that a little bit again tonight, but I don't want to recover all of it for the sake of time. Uh, but the Samaritans were a despised group uh, of people because the Jews saw them as imposters. Um, this is a group of people who had long ago departed from their true Jewish heritage. They had become apostate Jews. Um, they had set up a competing temple in Bethel. They had uh, departed from the Torah. They had dismissed Moses' Torah as being illegitimate. They had set up their own priesthood. And they had adopted some Jewish beliefs and abandoned others. So they were a bastardized version, if you will, of the Jewish uh, culture. And they do trace their, their heritage all the way back to Abraham by birth. But in terms of their practices and their life and their culture, they had long ago departed from true Judaism. Yet they regarded themselves as the true descendants of Abraham and saw the Jews as the ones who were the imposters. So both sides saw the other as the imposter, and that's where the genesis of their hatred came from. They both hated each other because they saw each other as trying to be the true Jewish race, where they themselves saw, them, saw themselves as that. So here we, we find in, this, in these verses... Ten lepers who asked Jesus for mercy. And as we learn later, nine of them are Jew, one of them is a Samaritan. For now, though, the only description we see of them in these early verses is that they are lepers. Now, we've talked about leprosy before in here at an extended point earlier in this, in this teaching, in this, in this course. Uh, again, I won't repeat it all for the sake of time, but leprosy was a disease that took many years to claim its victims. It was a bacteria that... that at first only turned the skin white and eventually it started to numb the skin to the point where you couldn't have any feeling and that lack of feeling meant you would injure yourself without knowing it. That would turn into cuts. The cuts get infected. The infections eventually get gangrenous and that's how you would eventually see body parts falling away from the body. It's because of the infections that result from a lack of feeling in the body as this disease takes its course, removing the feeling sensation in the body. So it was progressive and it would go through stages. At times, it would be contagious, and at times, it wasn't contagious. It would come and go. And because it was so feared in that culture, it would be natural for these men, as you see it described here, to stand apart from the crowd, to be at a distance from Jesus, not to approach him. And that's because society insisted that they maintain a distance, that they be ostracized from society for the sake of others. And if they didn't agree with that policy, they were forced to obey that policy by violence because the fear of them was so great, the fear of the disease. So in this story, we see them call out for mercy. And they use a very interesting term. They call Jesus Master. Now, at first glance, you're going to assume, as you see, him, see them calling out for Jesus, that that would imply all ten are believing in Jesus as the Messiah, which would explain why they called him Master. That would be a logical assumption. And more than a few commentators, as they... Um, studied these, this part of Luke and written their commentaries have come to that very conclusion. So I should tell you up front that it's not unusual. In fact, it probably is the common view that these were ten believers. And that would be the reason why they use that term. Well, if you know me, you know I sometimes take a different view. And I, I'm going to take a different view here. I'm going to show you why I believe out of Scripture. The Greek word for master, uh, epitastasis or epitastasis, 
is only used by Luke. In all the Bible, and obviously we're talking about the New Testament here if we're talking Greek, uh, Luke was the only one to ever use this word. He used it a few times in his gospel, always to refer to Jesus, of course. It literally means chief or commander, as in a military term. And a Luke would occasionally show even the disciples calling Jesus master. No one else in the Gospels does that. Uh, Matthew always uses Lord. Uh, Mark commonly uses teacher. Uh, But Luke occasionally uses master. One of the occasions that Luke uses this, you'll find in chapter 5 of Luke, and it's a very interesting one, because it draws a parallel with the one you see here. This is the scene back in chapter 5 where Jesus comes upon Peter in the boat. He's just been fishing all night. He's caught nothing. You remember the story? And Jesus comes upon him in the morning and says, let your nets down again. Now, if you remember that story from either the way I've taught it or as you've studied it on your own, you remember that Peter's response is a bit bemused. It's respectful, but it's it's hardly the case that he buys into Jesus' thinking here as he obeys. And this is what he says. He says, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing. But I'll do as you say and let down the net. I believe I'm interpreting that correctly. I think his point there is very much the case that he's honoring Jesus' request, but he's not faithfully expecting a result from having done so. It's a bit like you know any expert who's busy at his work and somebody who doesn't know that line of work comes upon the job site and starts giving him advice. You don't have a lot of respect for that. I, I have a friend who's a, who's a craftsman, does, does a, a lot of carpentry work, and when he does a job for you, he always tells you that you know he'll, he'll charge you $100 to do the work, 150 if you help, and 200 if you watch. And I think, I think that's the sense here that Jesus has of, of you know, I've, or Peter has here of, Master, fine, I'll do it, but you know, I know better what I should be doing. But then, of course, the net comes up full of fish, at which point Peter falls at Jesus' feet and says, Go away from me, Lord. For I am a sinful man, O Lord. First it was Master, then it became Lord. More importantly, the the first title was used in a moment when Peter's trust in Christ was somewhat in doubt, I would argue. But his use of the term Lord came as part of a moment where there was obvious repentance and worship of Christ as God. And a recognition of Him as such. And the intervening moment between those two circumstances was a miracle that proved Christ's deity. At least to, to, G, to Peter it did. So now in this example, we learn, a, I think, a useful insight that we can apply here. These lepers begin by calling Jesus Master. And it's clear enough by the way the words used in Scripture that Master can have a wide range of meaning. Even just the definition in the Greek, it's, it, even though the, the disciples would occasionally use it, it was probably a common term in the day, and it, it generally was just a term for respect, or a respectful term for anyone who was in authority. Like we might say, Sir. It was a respectful term. So calling Jesus master, I would argue, doesn't necessarily mean that the person using the term has a true faith in him as the Messiah. Remember, a lot of people have respect for Christ. Good teacher, wise man, you know, man of peace, whatever, whatever, whatever. But if you press them to actually answer the question, was he God in the flesh, you won't find them coming back with a positive answer. So, it's one thing to have respect for the man, to consider his teachings, to listen to him, and so on, and to come to him for healing, if you think he can provide it. It's another thing altogether to see him as the Messiah. Remember, Jesus himself teaches in Matthew 7:22 that on the day of judgment, there will be those who call him, Lord, Lord, using the very term Lord, in fact. And yet Jesus will say he never knew them which simply proves that you can use the title. That doesn't mean you have to believe all that it suggests. That's, simple. That's simply evident. So the lepers call out Master, and Jesus' response to them is this. He says, go present yourselves before the priests. Now, why would Jesus make that request? It's a bit odd, wouldn't you think? It's, it's almost without connection to the moment. It doesn't seem to apply in the moment. They ask for healing, and he says, go show yourselves to the priests, which would mean they're in the region between Samaria and the Galilee, they're at least 40 miles from Jerusalem. So to show themselves to the priests means walking all the way to Jerusalem. Now maybe the Samaritan would have walked to Bethel, but regardless, that meant going somewhere other than where they were. It meant a long journey. Start on your trip. The reason he asked them to do this, frankly, was because of Levit- Leviticus 13. Leviticus 13 is the definitive chapter out of the Old Testament on leprosy 
and how leprosy was to be handled in the camp of Israel. Lepers, as you go study that chapter, if you're interested, lepers can be considered clean. And I mean, ritually speaking, under the law, they could be considered as clean under certain circumstances, and the law defined that. And it was principally that their skin had no open sores. I don't mean to be graphic with you, but that's what the book says. So if they were in a state of remission, if you will, they could be pronounced clean. And the pronouncement, though, this, this certification of cleanliness had to be made by the priest. So you'd have to go before the priest while you were in your state of remission and say, look, I'm okay. Am I good enough to be clean? And usually there was an atonement process in the moment, a sacrifice in the temple, something to kind of you know, re- reflect the atonement that you sought, and then a, a pronouncement of you're clean. You could re-enter the camp of Israel. You didn't have to, you didn't have to observe the distance. You didn't have to stay out of the camp. You didn't have to, to, to you know, avoid touching people. All the things that would normally have been required of someone who was unclean. But of course... As the disease progresses in the person's life, because it's not curable, at least not in that day it wasn't, and it is a progressive disease, the sores would be more persistent. They would um, eventually, you know, remission was less and less often. And so at some point in a person's progression through the disease, they, they, they just stopped being able to ever be unclean. In the worst stages of the disease, they would never reach a point of being unclean again. So the point here is that when Jesus said to these people, go present yourself to the priests, it's implicit that they should expect to be clean by the time they get to the priest. I mean, you don't present yourself to the priest while you're still in a state of uncleanliness because he's just going to look at you and say, I'm sorry, you're unclean. So the only reason you go is if you have some expectation that when you get there, you'll be clean. So they understood what he was saying. In other words, they knew that he was saying, I'm going to heal you. Start Start going to the priest so that they can declare you clean. And sure enough, they do that. At this point, we're told, one of the ten... Uh, a man that Jesus calls a foreigner, turns back and gives glory to God. Now, I think by the way it's phrased in the Scripture, if you look at it carefully, it seems evident to me they didn't get very far. There's no evidence about how far. That's not really germane to the story. But the point is, the guy didn't get all the way to the priest, be declared, you know, declared clean, and then walk all the way back. It's evident that he stops. He doesn't persist in going to the priest. He immediately identifies the fact that he's been cleansed, that he's no longer leprous, And in that moment, he gives glory to God. More than just giving glory to God in the moment, he turns around and seeks out Christ again, finds him, and continues to give thanks to God at Jesus' feet. Does that remind you of the story out of Luke chapter 5? Just a little bit. While this scene goes on, we hear Jesus ask a rhetorical question. We know it's rhetorical because he answers it for himself. Um, A friend of mine used to say it this way. It's a rhetorical question, and he didn't expect anyone to answer it. Where are the other nine, he asks. Where are the other nine? That's a really interesting question to me. It's a really interesting question because he asks this question in such a way that suggests that coming back to give him thanks was a test of sorts. That that was the right thing to do. Now, I've heard, this is where I depart from some of the commentators because some of the commentators say that what he was applauding here was the man's obedience to come back and give thanks. And... What they say, what the ones I read say, is that the other nine are no less faithful followers of Christ. They're just not getting credit for having been thankful enough and that this man is getting applauded for being thankful, that the issue here is one of being thankful. I completely disagree with that. And here's why. If you wanted to be 100% obedient to Christ's word, what would you have done? Gone to the priests. If obedience and respect for Christ's word was really the issue here, you keep going. But it's clear enough by how Jesus responds here that he's not happy with the fact that the other nine don't return. Is it not the case? Is he not, in your reading of the text, suggesting that the other nine are at fault for not returning? Though he told them to go to the priests. So it's evident by his response that what he was happy about was that one didn't go to the priests, but rather came and gave thanks to him. And the nine who continued on were in some way doing the wrong thing. Well, how could that be? And then to add insult to injury, he refers to this man as the foreigner. We know that in the text itself we're told this man is a, is a Samaritan. Uh, the word foreigner here, allogenes, or genies, allogenes, this is the only time in the entire Bible this word is used. One time and one time only. Here it is. Uh, it literally means of a foreign race, not of the same race, which, can, can sit, which goes together very well with the thought of Samaritan. That's how Samaritans were viewed. To the Jew, remember, Jewishness was a race. 
not just a culture, not just a nation, not just a border, but it was a race. A race comes that came from Abraham. And he's declaring this man to not be a legitimate member of the Jewish race any longer. He is an illegitimate member. He's a foreigner. The scene is interesting here, therefore, in that he is not only citing the fact that this man did the opposite of what he told him to do, and yet he did the right thing, but it's interesting in that he is pointing out to the crowd the only one willing to do that was the foreigner. So we need to understand why this is so significant to Jesus and what he's really trying, what, what Luke, I guess, is really trying to show us through the capturing of this scene. Remember Peter on the boat. One moment he's calling Jesus master, but doing it in a dismissive way. The next moment Jesus performs a miracle, and in that miracle, Peter quickly changes his tune, and he falls before Jesus, calls him Lord, acknowledges him as Lord. In other words, whatever Peter may have thought of Jesus before the miracle, it is obvious enough that once the truth was revealed, Peter knew how to respond. He knew that standing before God meant doing what he did. Recognizing his own sinfulness, his own unworthiness before God, and uh, in a worshipful stance acknowledging who God was. He let all his pretense drop and he acknowledged God in Christ. Now, here we have ten men who, in part, are following a similar pattern. Yet only one of them completes the pattern and praises Christ, giving him the honor, an honor reserved for God. And so I would argue it's apparent that this man is a faithful follower of Christ. Jesus himself acknowledges. He says, your faith has made you well. No doubting that this one is a faithful follower. So that leaves us with the other nine to wonder a little bit about. Look at what Jesus says to this man in verse 19. As I said, he, he says, your faith has made you well. Now, this statement makes no sense if Jesus merely means your faith has made you physically well. This statement makes no sense if that's what he's saying. And I'll tell you why. Because the healing's already taken place. The healing has already taken place. That's why the guy returned, because he had been healed. So I don't believe this statement is talking about a physical healing. I think this statement is talking about a spiritual healing. This is equivalent to when he has said in other cases, your faith has saved you, or your sins have been forgiven. Your faith has made you well, in other words, spiritually speaking. A foreigner willing to receive the Messiah while Jews reject him is effectively the message here. Now, let me show you some evidence for that. The best evidence of this difference, I think, is found in Jesus' command of the group and what it means that you followed the command as the other nine did. Jesus says, go and present yourselves to the priest. Now, when they did that, this act of presenting yourself before the priest as it's captured in Leviticus 13, it was a symbolic appeal to God for atonement. If you didn't already know this, I've taught this before, but, but leprosy is a classic picture in Scripture of sin. Some might argue that God even permitted that disease to enter the world so that he might have a picture to use in it to communicate the nature of sin, the way it pervades our body, the way it grows worse over time, the way it cannot be healed externally, the way that it begins to corrupt and deaden our senses to the damage of this world. It's a very, very good picture of, leprosy, uh, of sin. And similarly, the fact that it can be cured only by a, a miracle in their day a washing clean, if you will, is another picture of how God alone can do the work of salvation in a sinner. So it was a symbolic act to come before the priests and ask for a, a, a pronouncement of cleanliness. I mean, in that moment, it was an earthly illness and it was ceremonial cleanliness, absolutely. But they pictured a spiritual disease called sin and a spiritual cleansing of God through an intercessor, the priest. Under the law, the intercessor was the priest. So where do the nine Jews go after having been cleansed? Well, presumably they went on to the temple. They presented themselves before that priest and they were declared clean. They went before Levi priests who mediated a law of Moses. And they worshipped there, presumably, because they didn't recognize that their God was already present in their midst in the form of the Messiah. So they persisted in following the old way, oblivious to the fact that the new way had already entered into their world. On the other hand, the Samaritan, who had been cleansed just like them, may have said to himself, why do I need to go before a bunch of men who intercede on behalf of a God who's already arrived in person? Why do I need to have some man in a temple with a, with a law that's been replaced by a new covenant declare me clean when the true God has made me clean in the ultimate sense? Now, I don't know whether this man understood all these implications, and it's probably the case that he didn't. 
But he didn't have to in order for God to use this situation and his behavior to educate you and I through the Scripture about what's really going on right here. I think Jesus is making a point to the Pharisees and to the disciples in how he reacts to this man to teach that the king has arrived, the kingdom is in their midst, something he's been saying repeatedly, yet the ones who were intended to receive that kingdom, the Jews in other words, had turned their back on the king and were persisting in the law, persisting in the old way, whose purpose was never to do more than simply point you to the new way. And yet the new way came and they persisted in the old. Nine men who had been cleansed by God himself in person continued to go to priests in an old temple to worship a God in that way. Now, you could say I'm wrong and that they were believers and they were simply confused. Fair enough. But I find it interesting how Jesus responds to their lack of returning in comparison to how he responds to the Samaritan. You can draw your own conclusions. Finally, he makes the point, of course, that this is a foreigner. Remember as we started the chapter 15? Jesus was being received by sinners and tax collectors, we're told. Now by Samaritans. And yet being rejected by a church or by, by a culture that was supposedly looking for him. I think that's also implicit here. The point being that the Jews would reject him. The Gentiles would receive him. Now from this brief lesson, the Pharisees were told begin to question Jesus about the coming kingdom. And let's look at those verses. Verses 20 through 25. Now having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered them and he said... The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. And he said to the disciples, the the days will come when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. They will say to you, look here, look there. Do not go away, and do not run after them. For just like the lightning, when it flashes out of one part of the sky and shines to the other part of the sky so will the Son of Man be in His day. But first, He must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. If you're wondering why the Pharisees started in this conversation, I I don't think it's hard to see how they would have drawn a connection to what just happened. And that might have prompted them to ask this question. Because I think it's natural for them to jump to the topic of the kingdom here for several reasons. First, you've got Jesus Himself, who just mentioned the kingdom on a number of prior occasions in the chapters we've been studying, presumably in the last few days or weeks, it's been a constant topic that's been coming up. So it's on their minds. That's much, that much is true. And then secondly, the situation they just witnessed, the one with the lepers, could have easily triggered the question because the leper here is praising and worship, worshiping Jesus as his Messiah. So he's making a spectacle of himself right there in the middle of the crowd that would have naturally prompted the Pharisees to ask sort of a sarcastic question, um, sort of a question that was more, than, more of a test than a, an honest desire to know something. And so they see the man acting as if Jesus is the Messiah. Of course, that would mean the kingdom is here if he were the Messiah. So the Pharisees say, all right, so tell us, when is this kingdom coming? That's how I think the Pharisees approach the moment. And then you can see how Jesus answered them. He basically dismisses their question. I don't think he even gives them an answer if you really look at the details of what he said. He says to the Pharisees, the kingdom isn't going to come like you expect it to. Or the way you assume it's going to come. No one's going to say, look, there it is. Meaning, it's not going to come in such an obvious way that you'll be able to see it coming from a distance. Its arrival won't be so easy to find, so elaborate in its arrival, that people will be able to point it out and say, hey, look, and draw attention to it. If that's what you think, Pharisees, if you're you're assuming I can't be the guy you're waiting for because the kingdom hasn't shown up in the spectacular way you're expecting it, Well, let me just tell you, that's your problem. It's not going to appear in a way that draws attention to itself initially. Its initial appearing will be subtle. It will be under the radar, so to speak. And then Jesus makes the point that the leper himself was basically witnessing to earlier. He said, the kingdom is already in your midst. It's already here. Isn't that ironic? They ask when it will come, and Jesus says, it's too late, it's already here. Let me tell you, folks, if you're... If you're asking how will I know when the kingdom comes and then God responds to you by saying it's already here, that's a bad thing. That means you missed it. It means whatever you're looking for, you're looking for the wrong thing and you've got to get that right fast because you may miss it altogether. And obviously the Pharisees had missed it, um, which is all Jesus said to them. If you look at the content of what he says, he stops at that point, he doesn't give them any more. So he doesn't answer the question effectively. They asked, how will we know when it's here? How will it come? And he says, it's just not coming the way you think, it's already here. Done. 
But then we're told Jesus begins to teach the disciples on the kingdom. He does this quite commonly, right? He, he gives something to the, to the Pharisees, but very little, short of just admonishment. But then he'll turn and begin to give the real instruction to the disciples. How did that happen in the moment? Was it such that he walked aside where the Pharisees couldn't hear it? I don't know. Maybe it was separated in time. One moment with the Pharisees, later he, he talks to the disciples. Could be. Maybe they heard it all and they just didn't understand it because the Holy Spirit didn't enable them to. Jesus tells them in this ominous way, as I see it, that there's going to come a day when they're going to long to see the very thing that was in their midst at that moment. Which is to say, that the Son of Man, the Messiah. What they had then, there would come a day when they would long to see it again. This is the latest attempt, I think, by Jesus to clue them in on the fact that he was going to die and leave. Now, he says it plainly at the end. But this isn't the first time. He says in chapter 9, 22, back in Luke 9, he had said this, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. But for, so far, this hasn't made the impression he's wanted it to make because it's not getting through. In fact, for the most part, it doesn't get through until after the death. He's giving them this insight, but it's really insight for a later day. And it's not making its way through. And so when he says here, that there's going to come a day when you want to be in the midst of the Son of Man, but you're not going to be able to. He won't be here. That in itself is a stunning statement if they could have appreciated it, because they're not expecting that. Remember, the thought is the king comes, the kingdom is entered into at that moment, and it's over with. This idea that there's an intervening period of waiting is a completely foreign concept to them, and it remains such all the way until he dies. When that day comes, after Jesus has died and left the earth, the disciples, he says, are going to wish they could have him back in their presence. We know that feeling. That makes perfect sense. But there's a danger in that desire. And that's his warning here to them. When you want something bad enough, your desire can turn into impatience. And impatience can become the motivator for you to follow the wrong thing. Because you're wanting so much for the thing you want to happen that you'll look for it even where it's not. Even when it's not there, you start to see it and you start to follow it potentially and you're following the wrong thing. So Jesus knows that he's going to depart. He knows that they're going to want for him to return. And so he gives them this logical warning. He says, when you're there wishing that I was there and then someone comes up to you and says, oh, he's here. Look, it's this man down in Puerto Rico who's telling everyone he's Jesus. I don't know. Where's this guy lately? That you know the guy I'm talking about? Some, where is it? Florida? Maybe he moved to Florida. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, well, it doesn't take me more than 10 seconds to know that is not Jesus. But more importantly, Jesus says, never accept that. Never. If anyone claims to be Jesus, never accept it. No one can claim to be Jesus and be accurate. And you're saying to yourself, well, what happens when the real guy shows up? He answers that question with the next series of verses. He says, the Son of Man will have his day, his future coming, in other words, and that day will be obvious. It will be like lightning coming out of the sky, bright, brilliant, attention-grabbing, obvious. You don't need to worry about having to look closely to find Him. You're not going to have to worry about missing Him on that day. There is, so, there is no chance anyone in the world will miss Him on that day. So the point is, until that day, you are not to accept anyone's claim to be Christ because it cannot be true. Fundamentally, because of the nature of His coming. Now look at, the just, look at how... Those two things come together. Doesn't this sound contradictory? On the one point, he tells the Pharisees, hey, this kingdom, it ain't coming the way you think. By the way, it's already here. To the disciples, he turns and says, never accept anyone who tells you I'm back because you won't have a problem missing it. Almost seems contradictory. Well, of course, we know how to resolve those two now, don't we? The Pharisees, as Jesus was talking to them, were hearing about the first coming, about how God was going to establish his kingdom in its early stages the kingdom that is established by Christ's first coming. The kingdom of believers, in other words, that began with the apostles and then has grown to cover the earth with believers. That's the kingdom. That's the form of the kingdom that we have even today. You know, it's no less a kingdom because a kingdom is two things. It takes two things to have a kingdom. It has to have land and subjects. I can go buy a piece of land out in Bolverde claim it as my own, stand in the middle of it and call it my kingdom. And to me, I'm right. To the rest of the world, I'm an idiot. I may be anyway, but that's another story. So, the point is, it is not a kingdom if there's nothing to rule over. So a kingdom has to have subjects. On the other hand, a kingdom can be people, but ultimately it's not a kingdom in any physical form, in a tangible way, until that group of people is centered somewhere and collected and borders are established and then you have the kingdom complete, both the land and the people together. So as we speak, 
Even today, and in the time Jesus spoke these words, God is building his kingdom. He's doing it one believer at a time. So what he's doing, essentially, is he's starting with the subjects, not the land. What Jesus and the, what the Jews and the, and the apostles themselves considered the process to be was get the land and then bring the people in. The difference isn't the, proce- the, 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 difference isn't the end state. The difference was the process. God says, I'm going to start with the people and then I'm going to give them the land. So in a time to come, that second part of the kingdom is going to be established. We know from Scripture the Lord will return to earth to occupy land, land given to the nation of Israel originally, land we call Israel, though the current day Israel, its current borders, are a sliver of the land that was actually defined in the Bible as Israel's land. Israel's land goes all the way to modern-day Iraq, all the way to modern-day Syria, all the way down uh, well past the current border with Egypt. So that's where the new land, that's the land that will eventually be the kingdom. And, and of course, the land, that's not the extent of Jesus' rule. The whole earth will be his kingdom as he rules from that piece of land. But that land will eventually be his kingdom, his physical property, even as it is now, though he's not expressing that, that authority yet. He has not come down to claim it yet. And within that border will be the people, his subjects, those who have been brought into the kingdom by faith, both Old Testament saints, the church today, and even Jews in the future who will come to believe after the church is raptured. Jesus, the king with his kingdom, both subjects and land. And when Jesus comes in that day, there's not going to be any mistaking his arrival. You can read that in Revelation 19. I'll just read a couple of verses for you here. Verse 11, John says, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen white and clean, were following him on white horses. That's you and me. With his mouth, uh, from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has the name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You're not going to have to worry about mistaking that day. There's no other day like it. Nor will there ever be. So when Jesus tells the Pharisees, hey, your kingdom's already come, you've already missed it. He's meaning that you're not understanding the nature of the kingdom in its present form. And yet then he turns to the disciples and he says, there'll be a day in the future where you'll want to see me. You won't. Don't fall prey to people who would imitate and claim falsely that I'm back. You'll know me when you see me. And to the Pharisees, he's speaking of the first coming to the disciples, the second coming. But then in verse 25, I think Jesus brings it all together. He gives the disciples another prediction of his coming death. In other words, he tries to prepare the disciples yet again for the unimaginable. But you know, that's a hard message for you to accept if you were a disciple in the day. I think it's, far, I think it's hard for us to appreciate that. You've looked all, your, your culture has looked for centuries, looked forward to the day of the Messiah's arrival. He's here, and you're sure it's him. And he's proven himself to be him. Only to tell you, I'm leaving. Huge letdown. Okay, almost so big a letdown they never accept it in his life while he's on, on the earth walking. They have to wait till after the resurrection to fully grasp it. Huge disappointment. But you've got to recognize that what they wanted was what we want. But they had it seemingly in their grasp. Like the fish on the end of the line. You know, it's, it's right there, and then it's gone. We never really had that experience. We've had it in the later stages of its maturing, of, of coming into the body after all of that's taken place. So for us, it's not as though we've lost anything. All we feel is the gain of entering the body of Christ. And truly, they lost nothing either. But the effect of his leaving is to feel like you've lost something, to feel like you had something and now it's not where you expected it to be. Huge disappointment. I have to believe it was for all of them. Can you imagine what it felt like after the, res- after the death of Christ, but before you knew he'd been resurrected? That is the crisis of faith that I think could lead someone to completely repudiate all that they had believed to be true. It's just a crushing kind of blow. But God was certainly gracious and I'm sure the Holy Spirit comforted them to the point where they could understand the truth in the day they were intended. I think there's two lessons for us here, at least. Number one, I don't think we ever want our desire for Christ's return to lead us to see His kingdom established in any way other than it is intended to be established, one believer at a time. That in other words, there is thinking in the body of Christ, there is false teaching that suggests that Jesus' return is predicated on the entire world becoming a believer. On every last human being down to the last soul living on earth becoming a faithful believer. And only in that one moment, only as the last person on earth becomes a believer, will Christ return. 
It's a form of eschatology that expects that the role of the church is to convert the whole world, and that's why he hasn't come back yet, because we haven't achieved that end. You only have to look at the events of Revelation to know how much unbelief will be on the world at the point of Christ's return. But yet, our own desire to have him back I think is a part of what leads some to believe in that kind of belief. To say, I'm going to do my part to hasten Christ's return. I've actually heard ministries that use that very term. To say things like, we are holding evangelism, we are holding outreach, we are doing these things because we want to bring Christ back sooner. Or they say it from a different perspective. We are trying to disrupt the Middle East, we're looking for ways to get the world's political environment to change in such a way that's consistent with Revelation so that we might hasten those events and get the world to the point where Christ returns sooner. As if we could do that. Right? As if we're, his timetable is, is within our control. It is not to say that we are all going to make that mistake, but it is indicative of the kind of mistakes that come along in our lives if we let the desire to see him return overwhelm our, our, our ability to study Scripture in an honest and open way. So that's one mistake we can make. We ought to live every day expecting his return today But we also have to be prepared to wait a lifetime and even beyond our lifetime, if necessary, for that day. So expect it today. Be prepared to wait until you see him after your death. Secondly, if we are all now subjects of this king, if in other words the kingdom is already in place by virtue of our entry into it as a subject, though the land has not yet been claimed, then... That means that while we're waiting for our future king's arrival to claim that land, we are still obligated to live under the rules and expectations of that king and of his kingdom. Do you know when you're outside this country as a U.S. tourist traveling abroad, you still have to pay your income taxes. You know, you're still under the laws of this country as a citizen in any way, even if you're traveling abroad. And as Scripture tells us in Hebrews, we are wanderers in in a foreign land, in a country that is not our own. It's in that sense that we are subjects to another kingdom that is yet to actually come in physical land form on this world, but we are no less subjects of that kingdom. So we are no less obligated to the king and to his decrees and to his expectations. And remembering, of course, that one day he will be here, we will all answer for what we did with the time he gave us while he was gone. So what kind of subjects are we? Maybe the last question. And are we ready for his return tonight? You know, that question I use in that survey I mentioned in my Sunday class where it says, if you knew Jesus was coming back in 12 months, what would you do personally with those 12 months? It's a trick question, by the way, because no matter what you tell me, I get to turn around and tell you, the scripture says we're to live each day as if he's not just coming back in 12 months, but next minute. So whatever you put on that form, I have right to ask you, why aren't you doing it? So the real question is, are we living like he's coming back right away? And the answer for most of us is probably no, or at least not to the extent we should. So are we the subjects of a king who is promised to return, who is trustworthy to his word, and therefore we have every expectation to see him return, not if, but when, and therefore are we living accordingly? That's the message I believe that Jesus is placing on the disciples. It's not just to let them know he's leaving, but to explain to them that he is returning in a way that will be obvious for them. Let's go to prayer. Father, I'm grateful that as Jesus explained these words to the disciples, he was caring and thoughtful. Caring and thoughtful, Father, in in such a way that he could help them understand that while he had to go, it was not the end of the story, he would return. That is the promise, Father, of the New Testament. That is the promise and the hope that we all rest in, Father, to know that you will return, we will be with you one day. For some of us, Father, it will come because we leave this earth and greet you. But perhaps for some of us, Father, it could be that we are here and he comes to greet us and returns us to his time with the Father in heaven. Father, we look forward to either way, however you choose, Father, to return or have us return. We look forward to that day. Father, let us be loyal and faithful subjects in this kingdom that you are building. Subjects, Father, who hear your words and obey them. Subjects, Father, who proclaim the goodness of their king. And subjects, Father, who do their best to live like him here and now so that he might be seen here through us. Father, we pray we would be uh, inspired by the word tonight, by the power of the Holy Spirit to do those things. And Father, I pray that as we continue this study, you'd continue to pour out a blessing on us for the faithfulness of this small crowd who would come and study in this way. Let us come back again, if it be your will, Father, in two weeks as we pray to continue. And 
In this time of fellowship remaining, Father, I pray that you would just uh, do a work through the Holy Spirit even in that time, that we would uh, show the love of Christ to one another. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.